morning, good evening, and good night. <laughs> so today is a, a greatest honor to have Professor Smir. Um, he's uh, from uh, University of Hawaii at M Manuha. So I guess that's a very nice place everyone wants to go. So Smir is get his PhD from the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology and get his have his uh, postdoc experience from the Iowa State University. So he has, he's also now associate editor of Bioresource Technology. So he has done lots of work about the uh, anaerobic wastewater treatment and also the biotechnology uh, resource recovery. So today, let's welcome Smir to give, our, like, give us a lecture. Welcome, please. Hello, I think Professor uh, Samir is offline. Sit, yeah, he's out. He's offline. Let's just wait for a minute. Hello. Hello. <laughs> you are offline. <laughs> um, you can start now. Do you miss my introduction? <laughs> Actually, uh, I think something got disconnected, but now I'm connected. Oh, okay. You can share your screen and you can start now, please. Is it, can, you, can you hear, can you see my screen or no? Yes, yes, please. Let me see because I think there's, uh, let me see, I'm seeing. Share my screen. Share my screen. And then uh, let me open my PPT. Okay, now it looks good. Uh, you can start now, yes, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much and a very good evening. Uh, my name is Samir Kanal and today I'm going to give some overview of anaerobic processes and focusing on waste treatment and bioenergy production. And just give you a little bit idea of what really anaerobic processes is. The name itself tells that this is the biological processes that occurs especially in absence of a dissolved oxygen or oxygen and it produces uh, two important gases component which is methane and carbon dioxide sometimes collectively known as biogas so anaerobic processes usually occurs in many natural systems such as deep oceans lake sediment and also in waterlogged fields such as paddy field marshland or any other you know uh, systems as a highly polluted rivers and also in the digestive systems of human being and then and, and animals as well so this is very common phenomena in many natural system but also we can have the anaerobic system in the engineer system which we're going to talk about a little bit later so now why anaerobic digestion why this is uh, so important technology uh, because it produces clean and renewable energy uh, from different type of feedstocks, uh, which can be used to produce uh, stationary power such as electricity, but we can also use biogas as, as a transportation fuel, or it can be upgraded into uh, natural gas and we can inject into the gas pipeline. So it has uh, many different applications. As I mentioned, it can handle diverse type of waste stream, including animal manure, biomass, it can also be used to convert wastewater into energy as well. So it has many different feedstocks it can handle. This is a very mature technology. Uh, there are thousands of plants currently in operation in different countries. And not to mention, there are millions of small scale digesters in many developing countries 
uh, producing especially the heat sometimes even for the uh, cooking gas and at the same time it can be used in a very decentralized location where there is no access to electrical grid so this is a very good technology especially for many of the remote areas where there is no access of any sort of electricity or, or energy and of, also it has a potential to reduce greenhouse gas emission in especially in developing countries where they can replace firewoods which essentially comes from forest resources at the same time it can also reduce the use of fossil fuels so that has a two different strategy importantly this is also technology for waste remediation so this is really a very uh, niche technology for both purposes and just to give you in a nutshell what really is anaerobic technology uh, it is essentially a, a big bioreactor that consists of a diverse group of microorganisms and different type of feed stocks organic materials which we call could be manure industrial wastewater sludge food waste even the biomass uh, can be fed into the digester where the anaerobic microorganisms convert those into biogas and then those biogas mostly consists of methane and co2 it may have some carbon dioxide it may have some hydrogen sulfide some ammonia and of course it is saturated with the water so first step we usually do is what you call biogas cleaning we remove some hydrogen sulfide if a high concentration we remove moisture so that it is a bit dry and then we convert this biogas in different applications and one of the commonly used in developed country is direct burning so we can just burn this one to produce uh, energy for cooking uh, especially cooking in, in many of the small scale digester or it can be upgraded which means we can remove some of the contaminant especially uh, co2 and we can get concentration of methane up to 99 percent and that can be used as transportation fuel or it can be injected into natural gas grid or we can also use this biogas what we call combined heat and power unit csp their potential electricity and thermal energy so these are the application of gas component and at the same time the solid residues which we call digested after digestion consists of both liquid as well as solid so we can store them for some time if you want to prevent the emission of some residual methane then we can separate the solid and liquid part solid can be applied to the uh, you know can be converted into pellets or biofertilizer and liquid can be applied to the land as a fertility irrigation so we can actually use the digested for fertilizer applications and i just want to give you one example of cambodia where i work for some time where this small scale digester their capacity is somewhere maybe two to six cubic meter volume usually they use those uh, this manure coming from different type of animals pig manure goat uh, they have also chicken litter as well as buffalo and a cow manure about 20 kg of the manure goes into 20 kg water they mix it and put in digester they stay there 20 to 30 days digest it and they use this gas for cooking as you see on your left side on the top the lady is using this biogas for cooking in their household and then the residue digested actually has a many different applications if you see on this picture up there they actually apply the digester directly into the paddy field in the rice field where they supply their nitrogen as well as some phosphorus and potassium and on the front side they actually apply the digester which is much greener on the far side you can see a little bit of the brownish side which essentially is the chemical fertilizer so digester provided much better paddy yield 20 to 30 percent higher than the chemical fertilizer they actually also use this digester for horticulture they use to growing some of the herbs they sell in the market in a very high price premium price they also you can see the bitter melon bitter melon that has actually been grown using the digester as the fertilizer 
So they actually use for many other uh, growing other type of cash crops and the horticulture. And importantly, actually uh, in Cambodia, they use the digested for the aquaculture feed. They essentially supply this into the, uh, into the aquaculture pond where because of rich in nitrogen, some algae actually grows the top that become the fish feed, and then they actually grow, they cultivate fish. So this essentially becomes a, a separate, a multi biorefinery concept of using digest, the anaerobic digestion for producing electricity, producing uh, the heat, especially cooking gas, but also fertilizer for farmers for different applications. So this is essentially a very niche technology in Cambodia. They usually have about 26,000 of the small scale digester in different provinces. And they plan to build about a million of those digesters in the rural areas. Now, let me give you a little bit background on how this technology works. So what really happens in the anaerobic digester, as you see in this particular uh, figure, there is actually complex organic matter, which could be consists of carbohydrate, protein, and lipids, major component of the waste material. The first step is the hydrolysis, which essentially is breaking down of this complex material into a simple compound, uh, especially carbohydrate going into monomeric sugar, sometimes simply called sugar. Protein is actually breaking down into amino acid, AA, and the lipid goes into low chain uh, fatty acids, which is essentially a different type of fatty acids, and sometimes peptides coming from protein. So these are the uh, oligomers or monomers are the small chain molecule coming from the hydrolysis of complex materials, first step. This is also known as a liquefaction part. And after this become the smaller chain compound, they are converted into intermediate compound, uh, especially called the volatile fatty acids, consists of propionic, butyrate, valeric, capric acid. So these are C2, more than C2 to C5 uh, volatile fatty acid. Sometimes they also produce some lactate and ethanol. So this is the intermediate product of NRB digestion, sometimes also known as acidogenesis because it produces acid. Then once you get this intermediate products, they are then converted into a much smaller compounds such as acetic acid and hydrogen and CO2. This is also known as syntropic acetate oxidation and sometimes called acetogenesis because it produces acetic acid. And this is the syntropic group of microorganisms that degrades these intermediate products. And this acetate and hydrogen and CO2, these are essentially a, a, a kind of a reversible reaction. So they are essentially group of microorganisms that degrade acetate into hydrogen and CO2, these are called syntropic acetic acid oxidizing bacteria. So they degrade acetate into hydrogen and CO2. There are also a group of microorganisms that actually combine hydrogen and CO2 into acetic acid. Those microbes are known as homo, homo acetogens. The process is known as homo acetogenesis, where they convert hydrogen and CO2 into acetic acid. Now, after this step, these are the essentially almost end product. Now the last step of the anaerobic digestion is converting this acetate and hydrogen and CO2 into methane. So there are two pathways. One is called acetoclastic methanogenesis where acetic acid or acetate is converted into methane and CO2. The second step, a second pathway by which they produce methane is called hydrogenotropic methanogenesis where hydrogen and CO2 is combined to convert into methane. So these are essentially the last step of NRB digestion. So you can see this is the multi-step processes mediated by different group of microorganisms. I just want to give a little bit idea about the syntropic group of microorganisms. Now, if you look at this particular uh, equations, you'll see that propionic, butyric, and ethanol, these are the intermediate products. So these intermediate products are actually converted into acetic acid. Now this reaction is thermodynamically unfavorable. As you see, delta G value is positive. That means these reactions are not feasible under the normal conditions. So for this reaction to continue, 
there has to be some other group of microorganism that will remove the hydrogen from the system. So therefore, this hydrotropic methanogenesis and then syntropic group of microorganisms has to work closely so that all the hydrogen that is produced is being converted into methane. And by doing so, only the propanic, butyric, and ethanol can be converted to acetate. So these are essentially called syntropic group of microorganisms. And therefore, this is a very important reaction in any, any of the NRB digestion. So our main goal is to get this hydrogen out from the reaction, from this system as soon as possible so that the propanic, butyric, and the ethanol can be converted into acetic acid so that the delta G will become negative. So therefore, this group of microorganisms are called the syntropic group of microorganisms that depends on the hydrogen producing, the hydrogen consuming microorganisms. And this uh, required hydrogen partial pressure has to be all, most of the time less than 10 to the power minus four atm. So that, that means the concentration of hydrogen in the reactor system has to be much, much lower, 10 to the power minus four atmosphere. Now, as I mentioned to you that these anaerobic processes are carried out, carry out by the diverse group of microorganisms they are very interdependent, so they depend on each other for the, the reaction to go forward. And also, uh, these are carried out by some microorganism that has very low growth rate, especially methanogens. Their growth rate is much, much lower. And also, they are very susceptible to change in the environmental conditions, the temperature, the pH, the loading, as well as the other toxic compounds that are present. So they are very susceptible to those conditions. And importantly, uh, many of those microorganisms, especially methanogens, require very specific uh, micronutrient or trace elements, such as cobalt, iron, nickel, and manganese. So these are a very important critical trace element those microbes require. Even for a small concentration, we have to supply, we have to supplement for this reaction to occur. Now, there are another important group of microorganisms that are involved in the anaerobic processes are called surface reducing bacteria. And these are also obligate or they are also strict anaerobic bacteria. And these bacteria actually are very known because they produce hydrogen sulfide because they reduce sulfate and then producing those odorous gas. And also this sulfide will react with the iron and producing a black, uh, you know, black precipitate. So in many cases, in anaerobic condition, you will see the reactor becoming black because of the reaction of sulfide with the iron. So these group of microorganisms are also very common in anaerobic processes. And very importantly, this SRB or sulfur reducing bacteria are physiologically and ecologically very similar to methanogens. They compete for the same substrate, acetate and hydrogen. They have almost the same a growth condition like methanogen. So therefore, often they compete for the same substrate. But thermodynamically and kinetically, SRB are much superior. So they will overcome, they will outcompete methanogens. So if you have a sulfate in the reactor, the sulfate reducing bacteria will grow first and consume all the substrate and reduce the sulfate. And after that, only the methanogens will start to proliferate. So these are some of the nastiest microorganism in the system that compete for the substrate. Now, if you look at the reaction, sulfate is essentially electron acceptor, and organic matter, COD is electron donor. So essentially, that will degrade the organic matter, take the electron from the COD organic matter, and the sulfate will get reduced to sulfide, which is essentially the, the pungent smelling gas coming out from anaerobic processes. So these are some of the commonly occurring processes in the anaerobic digester when you have a sulfate in the system. Now let me give you a little bit overview of the historical perspective on the waste treatment. And if you look at this uh, figure on the left side, you can see like a stool or some kind of a chair, which is essentially uh, maybe clay or other type of stone chair. And on the side, you will see two parts. In the early time, there was no any water system. There was no sewer system. So essentially, it was a dry toilet. If you look at this one, uh, people essentially used this pot to store this dirt or sand. 
So essentially, after finishing off, you know, your job, you essentially pour those dirt and you cover them. And that's why they call night soil because people usually do all the job in the night time. And then in the morning, early morning, then you have someone coming and collecting and disposing the waste. So this is essentially how the waste system was managed in early time because there was no any water-based system. Now this is another example. Uh, you'll see this kind of uh, system also in London uh, uh, Museum, Science Museum, where you can see that they use the toilet system, but it doesn't have the water inside. It actually contains the uh, dry dirt. Essentially, you essentially pull the piston and then the dirt will fall and cover all these feces. So this is how they essentially collect, or they essentially do all the, the toilet system was run in early time. The only disadvantage was, of course, you have to use a lot of dirt, about 2.5 ton per year for a family of six. And of course, you have to dispose them. So these are some of the uh, early process of the waste management. Now, if you look at the NRB digestion, this is one of the <clears throat> very oldest technology that is in use for waste stabilization, especially human waste, animal manure, agriculture waste, even the municipal sewage. So they were essentially used the NRB digestion. And the first reported uh, publication in the NRB digestion comes from the French journal Cosmos in 1881. They use the term called Maurice automatic scavenger. So this is essentially the terminology they use for NRB digestion. Then Donald Cameron uh, from England developed a septic tank system in 1895 for treating especially the human waste. But this technology was patented, patented by the Donald Cameron. So it was very expensive for common people to adopt. So Imhoff from Germany developed what we call Imhoff tank in 1905. And then this tank essentially consists of the two-stage system. So it has the settling tank at the top side. If you look at this one here, this, this top side essentially is a settling basin here where the feces or the waste solid material settle down and goes at the bottom side. And then the liquid, fresh liquid, which essentially contain without solid, with actually effluent, they're essentially discharged. So essentially collects, separates the solid and liquid part. And on the left side is essentially a septic tank where all the sea waste or the, the human waste is stored maybe about five to six month time. And the liquid comes out from the top side and then it goes into leaching bed where you essentially leach out the liquid into the soil. And then the soil microorganism degrade those organic matter and the you treat. So essentially, the, the field or the soil uh, in, in the leaching bed essentially acts as the filter media and the treatment system. So this, this is how this, this wastewater from other households are being treated in early time. Now let me give you some example of the wastewater treatment, how we treat the wastewater. So in the anaerobic processes or, or, or aerobic processes, there are two types of retention time. The first one is called the hydraulic retention time or SRT. The second one is called SRT, solid retention time. As you know that in any of the anaerobic processes, we require a very long SRT, talking about hundreds or thousands of days because of the slow growth of microorganisms. So SRT reflects the amount of microorganism stays in the reactor. So if you took, uh, take example of continuous starting reactor or CSTR, the SRT and SRT the same. So that means the ratio of SRT and SRT is exactly one. So therefore, if we are using CSTR, we have to have a very long SRT or SRT to prevent the wash out of microorganisms. That's why CSTR run about 20 to 40 days SRT because of these issues. Now, if you want to treat a wastewater, dilute wastewater, which contain less amount of solid material, then you have to maintain a very, very long SRT. So that means in that case, the ratio of SRT to SRT should be much, much, much greater than 100. It should be sometimes 1,000, even more than 1,000. So therefore, for treating dilute wastewater, we have to maintain a very long SRT. That means we have to find a way to maintain the long SRT. So how can we maintain long SRT in the anaerobic system? irrespective of SRT. So there are different techniques. 
we can discuss. So first technique to maintain a long SRT in the system is called biomass immobilization. So in this case, we can use different type of attest growth media. So we can use some plastic media. Sometimes we can use some sand, gravel activated carbon, rubber beads, and so forth. So this essentially used as a biocarrier to allow the microbes to grow on the, on the surface. So it forms a biofilm. And by doing so, it can retain the high concentration of biomass in the reactor irrespective of SRTs. Examples include anaerobic filter, it could be off-flow or down-flow, rotating anaerobic contactor, expanded and fluidized bed reactor. So these are the example of the attest growth system, which are some sort of biomass immobilization technique. So these are the commonly used technique of maintaining long SRT in respect of SRT. The second technology that is commonly used is called the granulation of flock formula formation. So essentially, we can allow or there is a process that will help for microbes to form a granules uh, by the natural processes or different type of electrostatic processes. And it, it agglomerates and form a large granule of flux. And because of the larger size and higher density, they will settle down in the reactor. Example of these granulation processes include upflow anaerobic sludge blanket reactor, or it could be also downflow system. So there are these are the system where the the biomass forms a granule. So USB reactor is quite commonly used technique for granulation. <clears throat> the third example of the maintaining long SRT is biomass recy recycling. So sometimes we can use some pretty stocks that has high suspended solid, such as meat packing waste, wood fiber that allow the microbes to attach itself. And then they settle down and we can recycle those biomass back in the upfront like we do in activity soil processes. And that can also maintain long SRT respective of SRT. Example include an RB contact reactor or clary Digester. So these are the only type of anaerobic reactor where they were able to maintain a long SRT irrespective, irrespective of their SRT. So that is the third technique by which we can maintain long SRT. The last but not the least is the biomass retention. So if we can develop a technique by which we can retain the biomass in the system, they can, then we can also maintain long SRT. And very commonly used techniques include membrane. So you can use different type of membrane processes. Uh, example is anaerobic membrane bioreactor that essentially retain the biomass in the reactor. Thus, we can maintain long SRT. So these are the different techniques by which you can maintain the long SRT in the system irrespective of the short SRT and we can retain the biomass in the system. So now these are different classification of the bioreactor system. So example includes suspended growth system. Uh, there are different type of reactor system under suspended growth system as given here. We also have attached growth system, which is also given here. And we also, these are essentially used for high, low solid biomass. And we also have the example of a solid state anorbidization system. And these are the commercially developed or, or proprietary techniques such as Dranko digestion system, especially used for organic fraction of municipal solid waste or food waste, campo gas system, and Valorga. So these are the commercially developed technique for treating high solid waste stream. And of course, there are also different type of household small scale digesters such as fixed dome, sometimes called Chinese type and floating cover Indian type and polyethylene tubular digester. So these are the small scale digester currently being used in developing countries. Now, what are the advantages of anaerobic processes for wastewater treatment? Of course, one of the example, a very common uh, advantage is because it doesn't require any aeration. So a significant saving of the cost associated with the aeration, so about Aerating, removing one kg of COD, we require about 0.5 to 0.75 kilowatt hour of energy. So we can save those energy of aeration if we use anaerobic processes. At the same time, anaerobic processes also produces energy because of biogas production. About 1.29 kilowatt 
hour of energy is produced for every kg of COD removed in the anaerobic processes. So this is energy production processes. And because of less uh, low biomass yield, the sludge production is also much lower, about one fifth of the aerobic processes. So this is also a technique to reduce the sludge production. At the same time, if you look at the example, if we have aerobic processes such as activated sludge processes, one kg of the BOD will produce half kg of the biomass. So significant amount of COD is going into the biomass production. If you have anaerobic processes, more than 90% is going into methane, less than 10% is going into biomass production. So less amount of biomass is produced by using anaerobic processes. So therefore, the cost of treatment and disposal of the sludge become much, much lower. And also, uh, it, because of the low growth yield, the amount of micronutrient or trace element required is also much lower. And if you look at the nutrient or macronutrient, nitrogen and phosphorus requirement, they are also much lower. One pip of is what required for aerobic processes. And of course, we can apply much higher organic loading rate, somewhere in the range of maybe 30 to 40 kg COD per cubic meter per day compared to one to two kg COD per cubic meter per day for the aerobic processes. So it is a very high loading processes. But that's why we can have a very small footprint compared to the aerobic processes. At the same time, there are different type of, uh, you know, hazardous compound such as collinated compound chloroform or those compounds, they require sequentially anaerobic and aerobic processes for biodegradation. So therefore, anaerobic process become very ideal for treating those kind of uh, waste stream. But having said that, anaerobic process is not a panacea. This is not the solution for all the wastewater. There are limitations of the anaerobic processes. I just want to point out, uh, one of the pro limitation is of course, very long, uh, start of time, usually talking about a month or so, because of the slow growth of microorganisms, it requires much longer uh, start of time. Or at the same time, if somehow your reactor fails, it also requires you know a lot, much longer time for recovery. So that is another you know major drawback of anaerobic processes, and of course uh, they require very specific trace element micronutrients such as iron, cobalt, nickel, and manganese, uh, which is very important for methanogens. We have to supplement for the waste system which don't have those trace element. And of course they are very susceptible, vulnerable to change in the operating or environmental condition. If you change your wastewater characteristic, if you change your temperature, your pH, and there is some other you know, toxic compound is coming into the system, your reactor may fail very easily. So these are the, some of the limitations of the anaerobic processes. So what are the factors that we need to consider in the anaerobic digestion technique? Of course, we have to look at the substrate itself. Not all the substrates are equally biodegradable, such as you know, biomass, such as coming from you know, uh, uh, you know, energy crops and lignocytes biomass, they are very recalcitrant, so therefore it may take longer time, it may require some pretreatment. At the same time, if you look at the food waste, they are much easily digestible, so it produces a much rapid volatile fatty acid, so there could be issue of uh, high VFA accumulation reactor failures, so you have to look at the subject type as well. And some of the finished stocks such as, uh, you know, uh, cattle, they beef, dairy cattle, chicken manure, slaughterhouse, they have a much higher nitrogen content because of the protein, so that may produce ammonia that could be toxic. So these are the things we have to look at. Sometimes some of the waste water, especially coming from ethanol fermentations and so forth, contain a high concentration of sulfate. In that case, you, be, you can produce sulfide and that could become toxic. So these are the things we need to consider in designing the AD processes. And also we have to look at the carbon to nitrogen ratio. Some of the feedstocks such as lignocytic biomass contain very low nitrogen. Their CN ratio could be 50 or 60. So therefore they are not easily digestible. So we have to supply. The optimum CN ratio for anaerobic digestion is about 20 to 30. Optimum is 25. And the carbon to phosphorus ratio should be 50. At the same time, we have to supply micronutrient as well. And moisture content essentially is the, the uh, if we can do dry digestion 
with, with moisture content of less than 50%, the process could be much slower. So therefore, the moisture content also become quite important. We have to also look at microbial population, uh, which is a very important area. Although we can't control the microbial population in the AD system, but we can provide condition that is uh, you know, more favorable for the growth of the microorganism that is ideal for digesting the feedstock. So essentially, by operating the reactor at the ideal condition, we can maintain well-balanced microbial populations. We also have to look at the important operating conditions, such as the total solid content, the volatile solid content, oiling loading rate, solid readiness and time, and mixing. These are the important operation conditions we need to look at. And environmental condition also really be important. The temperature. Usually in our big process are operated at three different temperature conditions. Cicrophilic somewhere in you know, five to 10 degrees centigrade. Mesophilic somewhere about 30 to 35, 37 is the optimum. And thermophilic about 55. So these are the optimum temperature range for operating the AD system. And most of the AD system are operated at a mesophilic temperature about 30 degrees, 37 degrees centigrade. The pH is another very important factor for anaerobic digestion. It should be in the range of somewhere maybe 6.8 to 7.5. The 7 is the optimum pH conditions. And we also have to look at the, some of the degradation product, especially volatile fatty acids, which is also a very important intermediate. But at a high concentration, they can also start to consume the alkalinity and it lowers the pH, it actually started to fail. So in that particular range, we have to look at the polypenic acid. So we have essentially control the reactor in such a way, the polypenic acid concentration is much, much lower. So higher polypenic acid concentration means we are looking at the buildup of hydrogen, high, higher hydrogen partial pressure. At the same time, we have to look at the ammonia, salinity, and cation. So these are the, some of the products that we have to look at. A hydrosulfide, of course, is important parameter. And of course, we also have to look at the feed or influent toxic compound. NRB digestion are very susceptible to toxic compounds, such as different type of heavy metals, different type of organic micropollutants. So these are the important, such as you know, antibiotic and so forth. Those feed stock, those compounds could inhibit the NRB microorganism. So these are the, some of the things we consider in NRB digestion processes. So how you design anaerobic digestion processes? There are different models involved. And one of the very commonly used method is actually based on the organic loading rate model, where we use this equation where S is the substrate concentration, which is essentially at the volatile solid or COD, multiplied by the feeding rate of waste or wastewater, divided by the volume of the reactor. So essentially we can use this particular equation to, to find out the volume of the reactor, which essentially is designing the anaerobic processes. Now here, our goal is essentially to look at the two factor, whether our goal is to look at the efficiency of removing the organic matter. Sometimes we, we focus on removing the organic matter or wastewater treatment. Sometimes our focus is to improve or to improve our methane yield. The focus is to get a higher methane yield. So based on the objective function, we can select the different volumetric organic loading rate. So we can draw a plot. For example, if removal efficiency is objective, we can look at a different organic loading rate. What is our eff removal efficiency? So based on the given highest efficiency that is economically viable, we select the organic loading rate and we substitute this organic loading rate into this particular value here. And then we know how much subject we're adding, what we, we know how much our flow rate is, we can calculate the volume of the reactor. So that is one way of calculating the reactor volume and designing an AD system. And in, often in doing so, we conduct a lab scale or sometimes often a pilot scale study. So that provides you very, uh, you know, reproducible, and also confident data on, on developing a full scale system. So that is essentially designing the AD system. Now, let's look at some of the theoretical consideration. So in designing AD system, uh, we can essentially based on the methane yield, if our goal is to produce the biogas. 
So one way of calculating the methane yield is based on what we call Boswell equation. So this is a very common equation that is used based on the stoichiometry, the chemical composition of the substrate. If glucose is a substrate, your chemical formula becomes C6H12O6, and sucrose is a substrate that becomes C12S22O11. So depending on the type of substrate, we can use this particular equation, Boswell equation, to calculate the theoretical methane yield. So that is one way of calculating how much methane we can produce from the given substrate. So different substrate has a different chemical or elemental composition, carbohydrates, CH2, O, N, given here, protein, the structure is given here, this is for protein, fat, this is a plant biomass. So based on their elemental composition, we can calculate how much methane yield we can get. So if you have one ton of the carbohydrate, we can get about 370 cubic meter of the methane gas at under standard temperature and pressure. If you have one ton of protein, you will get about 510 cubic meter. If you have the one ton of the fat, you will get about 1,000 cubic meters. So based on this stoichiometry, you can calculate the theoretical methane yield. Now, in many cases, we may not know their chemical composition, such as wastewater. We don't know wastewater is a very complex. We don't know what is their chemical structure. In case of wastewater, we use a COD or BOD. So in this particular case of COD, we can calculate how much methane we can produce theoretically. So based on this calculation, if we know the COD of the wastewater, then about one kg of the COD will produce about 0.35 cubic meter of the methane at STP, STP. So this is essentially based on the COD value and you can calculate the theoretical methane yield based on the COD. And if you don't know the stoichiometry, you don't know also COD, then we have to do the, what you call BMP test. You essentially do a lot of biomethane potential test in the lab and find out methane yield. So that is the commonly done for many of the waste system for which you don't know the chemical formula, you don't know COD because it's, it's difficult to find out. So you essentially do the BMP test to find out the theoretical methane yield. So now let's look at the different type of reactor configuration. So there are different type of reactor that is currently being used in, in NRB uh, digestion system. The first one, the commonly used in early time, which is called NRB contact processes, which is very similar to the activity of processes. So you have a complete mixed reactor shown here, where this is closed reactor with mixing, and then where you produce most of the biogas. And then in this effluent, with the solid goes into degasifier because those biogas is attached on the solid particle. So it start to float. So we do degasification so that we will detest the biogas out of the solid material. And then the so solid one going into settling tank where we settle the solid part. And then the effluent is collected from here. The settled solid is recycled back into the tank to increase the SRT. So that is one way of maintaining the SRT. And this is called NRB contact processes, which is also a high rate system where SRT and SRT ratio is more than one. The second one is NRB filter, which consists of different type of ATS media. If you see on the figure on the right side, these are the biocarrier, plastic carrier, which are filled into the reactor. And then we essentially allow either the flow going from the top to the bottom up flow or flow coming from top to the bottom down flow. So essentially, this media acts as the biocarrier where the biofilms are formed on the surface. At the same time, they also provide the settling basin within the open space in the reactor where some of the biomass will form a flux and stay in the reactor. So about maybe 60% is attached and 40% is a suspended growth system in the off-flow uh, NRV filter system. So this essentially is attached growth system that is also used in the full scale system for treating dilute wastewater, which was developed by uh, Professor Young at, and, and Perry McCarthy in, in 1960s. And then we also have sometime use NRB baffle reactor, which consists of the baffle, as you see here, these are the baffle reactor, where these are essentially like a wall uh, that is essentially hanging from the top or bottom. 
then you can see the wastewater is fed from one end, it going down here and passes from the bottom side here. And then where it has microorganism, where it comes in contact with microorganism, converting this substrate into methane, then it goes up here and then again goes down. So this way, this baffle essentially acts as the, as the baffle to prevent the biomass washout. So essentially biomass are at, remain on these spaces where the microorganism come in contact with the wastewater and the converting into methane gas. So this baffle essentially act as a barrier to prevent the washout of the bio, biomass in the system. So that essentially also used as a high rate system. And the most commonly used high rate anaerobic reactor are what we call upflow anaerobic sludge blanket reactor, USB reactor, as you see here. So this is a very commonly used uh, reactor where your SRT could be hundreds and thousands of day. Your SRT could be just four to six hours. So you allow the micro, the wastewater to flow from the bottom. There's a distributor that allows the uniform distribution of wastewater. And these granules, which are about two to five millimeter size, are in this area where this wastewater essence helps to suspend them in the system. Now it produces biogas in the system here, as you see here. Then what happened, this biogas essentially comes up and collected in this biogas collection system. These are the deflectors that deflect the biogas into this collector system. And then the wastewater would essentially, after treatment, goes out from this open space up. Now, if you look at the, at the hydraulics of the system here, you can see that the surface area increases as you go up. So as the surface area increases, your velocity reduces significantly and thus allow this granule to settle down. If there's some granule that comes up. So that is a very neat design of the USB reactor. So that essentially provides increasing surface area with the low upflow velocity, allowing those granules to settle down in the system. And this way you can get a very high quality effluent collecting for the top side. These are the weir where you collect all your effluent and solid will settle back into the reactor. So this is essentially high rate anaerobic reactor for treating a dilute wastewater. Now there are also other type of reactor configurations such as plug flow reactor, which is very commonly used for treating a waste stream that has solid concentration of maybe 10 to 15%, especially the cattle manure, where you don't provide any mixing. Essentially you provide, you feed every day, they essentially move like a piston step by step without mixing in the longitudinal direction. And it essentially moves as you keep pushing the substrate and they will stay in this reactor maybe about 20 to 30 days time and then they produce biogas. So this essentially is a very low tech system for treating a wastewater, a waste, especially waste, uh, the dairy manure, the total solid concentration is maybe 10 to 15% where no mixing is provided. Sometimes they provide some heating, but essentially it's a very simple system for dairy or cattle manure with, with total solid concentration of 10 to 15%. This is CSTL reactor, very commonly used for treating uh, different type of waste stream where they provide mixing. Uh, you can see there are two reactor system actually. The first one is the main reactor where digestion takes place. Retention time could be 20 to 40 days where you produce most of the methane. The set, second reactor is essentially a storage tank because in the European Union, uh, there is a lot of uh, penalty if you are discharging your effluent without collecting the residual methane. So you have to store them maybe 20 to 30 days, sometimes 50 days to collect all the residual methane because methane is a very strong uh, greenhouse gas with the methane potential, with the, with the greenhouse gas potential of 25 uh, times that of CO2. That's why they have to provide a large storage tank here to collect all the methane in the system. And then you essentially discharge, collect, yeah, store them into large tank before discharging. And an orbit lagoon is also commonly used for different types of wastewater, especially coming from some of the animal manure where you have little some time, maybe 20, 30 days. But essentially these are provided sometimes mixing but sometimes heating system, but they are essentially come with a cover system and then they will collect the biogas and use for. So this is also a very simple system 
for large scale, you know, dairy manure, cattle manure, swine manure, and other industrial waste system that has a high solid concentration, maybe about seven to 8%, so forth. Now, another reactor, which is commonly used is actually a horizontal reactor. So if you have a substrate that contains, you know, plant materials, or sometimes dairy uh, cattle or beef cattle that has a lot of fiber material. Those fiber material are actually uh, started to uh, you know, float in the surface because of the light density and it started to clog all the openings. So that become quite difficult for digesting in these upflow or, or vertical reactor. So in this situation, the best reactor configuration could be horizontal reactor. By having horizontal reactor, you prevent the propensity of flotation of the biomass or, or clogging of the system. So in these cases, you try to use what we call the horizontal bioreactor. So these are very commonly used for treating those leafy biomass, those beef cattle and other type of fiber material and so forth. So now some of the other consideration, uh, nutrient and test metals are very important in NRB digestion. So we have to have enough nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, at the same time, we also supply cobalt, nickel, iron, and molybdenum, uh, very important for NRB processes. And also, if you have liquid waste stream, wastewater, we have to maintain COD nitrogen phosphorus ratio of about 357 is to 1 for high loaded system, or maybe about 1007 is to 1 for low loading system. So we have to have maintain those COD nitrogen and phosphorus balance. For high solid, feed stock such as manure, or it could be a biomass, we have to have a CN ratio of about 20 to 30. If it's low, that means it has a much higher nitrogen, so that will produce ammonia and it may fail. If you have a much higher carbon, that means it has less nutrients, so it may not work, so we have to provide external nitrogen source. It could be urea, it could be other type of ammonia source. So that essentially has to be maintained in, in NRB digestion. Optimum is 20, but 20 to 30 works good for, for, for those high solid feed stocks. Again, we have to look at the toxicity inhibition. NRB processes are very vulnerable to toxic compound. So we have to look at you know, if there's any heavy metals coming into the system, there's any type of cyanide or phenolic compound, at the same time, some of the toxic compounds are generated in the process, such as hydrogen sulfide, ammonia and VFA. So those, those parameters has to be monitored regularly in the AD process so that the system is running perfectly. At the same time, NRB processes require long acclimation if there is you know, toxic compound. And at the same time, by having the long SRT, we can somehow overcome some of the toxicity issue or you can maintain a long high biomass concentration. So by having those conditions, we can somehow reduce the toxicity effect or other type of perturbation. So they may become a little bit much stable if you have a long acclimation, long SRT or high biomass concentration in the system. Now let's look at the biogas side, which we didn't talk about much. So in the anaerobic processes, generally in the fully scale system, your methane content could vary from you know, 50 to 75%. So those are a typical methane concentration. The remaining is essentially carbon dioxide, the major portion, 25 to 40%. You may have some nitrogen coming from the air and so forth. There may be some hydrogen, but not much. Some oxygen will come also from the you know, leakage or gas. There could be some hydrogen sulfide coming from the sulfate reduction or could be coming from protein. And some ammonia may also be there. So these are the typical composition of the biomass. And if you want to use the biogas for transportation fuel, then we have to remove all the contaminant from the biogas. And at the same time, we have to have the methane content of 95 to 99%. So that is called biogas upgrading. So we have to upgrade the biogas to get the methane content of about 95 to 99%. So we can use this one in our cars or in other type of transportation. So that is essentially called CNG, complex natural gas, very similar to natural gas. So how can we use the biogas? So biogas can be used directly in the boiler fuel, like natural gas. It can be converted into electricity and heat using combined heat and power. We can remove all the contaminant and, and improve the methane content to 95 to 97%, and it can be injected into natural gas grade. 
grid, grid. It can be used as a vehicle fuel like CNG. It can be used in fuel cell. We can also use to produce methanol, biodiesel, and liquid hydrocarbon fuel by Fischer-Tropp method as well. So these are the, some of the utilization of the biogas. Now, there are two techniques comes into picture if you want to look at the biogas. One we call the biogas cleaning. The cleaning essentially involves removing of the moisture because biogas is saturated with the water. It has 100% water. So we have to remove the water first stage. The second is we have to remove the sulfide if there's any and ammonia so that the total concentration of this compound will be less than 5%. So that first step is called the biogas cleaning. And that can, after this one, we can use this biogas for producing you know, heat and electricity in CSP or direct burning and so forth. Now for biogas upgrading, in addition to removing moisture and sulfide and ammonia, we have to remove CO2. So all the CO2 has to be removed from biogas so that the methane content is about 98% by volume. Then we can use this biogas for car and transportation fuel, or we can inject into natural gas grid. So there are different techniques for removing this carbon dioxide or upgrading. Uh, these are given here. It can be used for absorption processes, such as pressurizing absorption. It could be used uh, in a gas washing, uh, the absorption process like gas washing, physical absorption, or chemical absorption. We can also use permeation processes, different type of membrane, or cryogen. So these are some of the techniques commonly used for upgrading the biomass. And the most commonly used technique is actually the, the, this one, they call water scrubbing. So they use water to remove or solubilize all the CO2 from the gas phase and, and get about 99% purity of the methane. The second one is pressure swing absorption, which is shown here, followed by the chemical scrubbing and organic physical scrubber and the cryogenic. So most commonly used is water scrubbing. And this is the uh, picture here showing the water scrubbing processes, which is essentially, we use the raw biogas here. It goes into compressor. From compressor, it goes into a tall tower where you actually inject from the bottom part and the water, which is pure water, coming from the top side. And that essentially helps to solubilize the CO2 into the water phase and we get the clean water, clean biogas coming out from here, which contain water, then it goes into dryer where you dry out the gas and this gas is now clean. So that is essentially the way you actually clean the CO2, remove the CO2 and get the biomethane. And now this water that comes out here contains some methane. And of course it has high CO2 concentration coming out from here. And then from here, it goes into the flash tank where you essentially remove all the CO2 from here, stripping tower from here. The CO2 essentially, again, going into the water system here again. And then you get all the CO2 going into the air. And then you essentially recycle the water back into the system. So essentially, you recycle back the water many, many times. So this process essentially based on the Henry's law that means solubility of the gas depends on the partial pressure of the gas and the concentration of the contaminant plus the handy constant. So this is essentially based on the Henry's law by which you separate the CO2 from the methane, uh, from the biogas. Now, how to remove moisture from the, from the uh, biogas? So in the full scale system, if you see the full scale bio digester, you will see the gas line actually going under what, under the ground. So in the underground, we can see the temperature is much lower underground. So because the low temperature, as you see, it passes through a tank where the temperature is much lower than the outside temperature. So that condenses the water. The water will drip out here and you get the clean water. So you can see this kind of tank in the NRV digester, full digester, where they essentially collect all the water from the gas phase and you clean the gas. So this essentially by condensation because of low temperature. This way you can remove the moisture from the biogas. Now there are different methods of removing the sulfide. So one way is using the water scrubbing, a pressure swing water absorption, as we discussed. We can also use pressure swing absorption PCA process to remove the hydrogen sulfide. 
We can also use different type of chemicals to remove the hydrogen sulfide. One commonly used method is iron sponge, which consists of essentially the iron that is impregnated with the wood chips, that essentially the ferric hydroxide, uh, ferric you know, oxide, essentially where you remove hydrogen sulfide, you can use different type of base, so the ammonium, uh, you know, here, sodium, by, uh, sodium hydroxide, sodium bicarbonate, lime as well, and these are essentially used to remove all the acid gases such as hydrogen sulfide from the biogas. We can also use biological methods such as chemoautotropic colorless sulfur bacteria that essentially oxidizes the sulfide, sulfur, sulfide into elemental sulfur. We can also use biofilter that consists of different type of fungal material and fungal biomass and other bacteria that removes the, uh, the sulfide or you can directly inject oxygen into the head space, air into the head space of the digester to oxi oxidize some of the sulfide. So this is a very simple process. So if you look at iron sponge here, this consists of the ferric hydroxide, then hydrogen sulfide goes into this reactor. This is a very exothermic reaction that essentially react with the ferric hydroxide and producing ferric uh, sulfide and produce a lot of heat. So it has to be kept in the moisture, otherwise you have issue of you know, heat or uh, burning. So as a safety precaution, you always keep this under moisture, otherwise it started to get fire. So that's why this reaction produces a lot of heat. It has to be maintained always moist state. And once you convert all the uh, sulfide into ferric sulfide, then you can regenerate them. Regeneration is very simple. You just have to do is supply air or oxygen from the bottom keep it moisture, so you can convert again this ferric sulfide into ferric hydroxide, ferric oxide, and the elemental sulfur and produce the heat, so you can recycle back many times. So this is essentially very simple processes of converting sulfide using iron sponge. You can also use the biological method to remove sulfide using thiobacilli, which are facultative autotrophs that oxidizes sulfide into elemental sulfur. The essentially, first step is Converting the sulfide, which is in the uh, aqueous phase, into going into the oxygen, you supply oxygen, they convert into elemental sulfur, producing high, again, hydroxyl ion, so your pH will increase. The increase in pH will again help to dissolve some of the gaseous sulfide into aqueous phase. So by doing so, we can continuously supply hydroxyl ion, increase the pH, dissolving the sulfide from gas phase and liquid phase and producing elemental sulfur. So this essentially is a very commonly used commercial processes uh, called thiopec processes to convert this uh, sulfide from the gas phase or liquid phase into elemental sulfur. And often in the fully scale reactor digester, what they do, they inject a small amount of air at the head space. As you see here, there's a different piping at the head space. You can see the white blood precipitate. This essentially is coming from the oxidation of sulfide into elemental sulfur because of the oxygen injection. So this is commonly used in a fully scale system where they convert all the sulfide into elemental sulfur for their space. So this is commonly used in, in the fully scale system. Now the last part of this lecture is about digestive. So we produce biogas, we use biogas to produce heat, electricity, transportation fuel, and so forth. So what should we do with the digestive, the solid material? The solid material also has a different applications, which we're going to talk about now. It consists of, of course, undigested material, different type of microbial biomass. So often, uh, in many cases, you actually then apply them because of rich in nutrient and because of rich in different type of trace elements. So people essentially apply to the land as a fertilizer. Sometimes we call it fertility irrigation. It also supplies some liquid part. So this is one of the way of supplying nutrient back into the, into the soil. But again, there are regulations. There's a requirement that you cannot continue to supply those because it may become over nitrogen rich soil. So they started to again, give a lot of different environmental problem of nitrogen leaching and nitrogen, you know, excess nitrogen in the soil. So we have to look at those, how much nitrogen you can supply in the field. And, and this is essentially a digested coming out from the digester. They essentially, they dewater them and they come out as a cake. And this essentially applied to the land as a, as a fertilizer. As you see here, these are essentially the cake, digestive cake uh, used as a biofertilizer. 
So I think that's pretty much what I have. And if you want to know more about the anaerobic processes, I have the book uh, that was published in 2008. It's still considered to be one of the, you know, quite uh, commonly popularly used book in, in many universities, a textbook, but also a reference book for many NRB digestion uh, people working in the field of NRB digestion. So this complete uh, concept of NRB digestion is given in this book. First edition, I'm working on the second edition. So with this one, uh, I think I'm done. I'll be happy to take any question you have. Okay, thank you very much for giving us su such a very com comprehensive lecture. So let's take some questions from the students or the listeners. Uh, Smir, there is some question from the, 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 using the text. Can you okay. see? Yeah. I have to see where the text, so uh, let's see text. On the right side. On the right side, okay, right side, right side. Okay, I cannot, let's see. Uh, if you, uh, at the bottom, if you click on where it says chat, you should be able to see the question. Okay, let me go again. Um. So the last speaker, okay. In the Zoom, in the Zoom screen. Yeah, Zoom, okay, let's see. So, it didn't show me any option actually here. Okay, let's see. Yeah. I have I the... Know, uh, even though I can read the questions. Oh, I, I see, I saw there's a, okay, optimize full scan. Can you read the question? I couldn't see anywhere uh, this question. Oh, I don't know. The question is, can the reactors easily be adjusted to different input or inflow? As far as I understand, very specific conditions like nutrients, trace metals, temperature, COD, and phosphorus balance. So they need to be maintained for successful anaerobic digestion. So however, the sludge and wastewater may vary in composition depend on the season and the source, like agriculture, domestic, and industrial. So it's okay. like, yeah. Yes, uh, let, me, let me go. So the, some of the very important design of the wastewater treatment system, uh, waste treatment system for AD processes are, you design your system based on the given waste characteristics. So if you're treating wastewater, uh, especially coming from municipal you know, wastewater system, then your design to be based on the given hydro loading rate, uh, SRT, a given SRT, given loading, uh, organic loading rate. So that system design for wastewater coming from one source cannot be used for different source because there are specific requirements for SRT, SRT and solid and mixing. So therefore, they are specific, but if they have similar, you know, characteristic, for example, if a USB reactor for dilute wastewater, uh, you know, different type of municipal wastewater from different places, I think that's fine. But designing a system for a given total solid concentration cannot be changed to different one because there is specific requirement for mixings and solid handling. So therefore, yes, they are, it's very similar to the other type of wastewater treatment system. So we have a specific requirement for a given SRT, given SRT, given TS concentration. So we have to stick to those requirements. So that's why, yes, we have to maintain a specific nutrient requirement uh, and a specific trace element requirement. And that's why they are very particular for a given set of wastewater characteristics. So yes, those are need to be maintained. Okay, thank you. There's another one. Do yeah. you have a general idea of how, um, what the energy cost is to create biofuel versus what is created? What's the, for example, with oil, it's approximately, approximately one to three, like the energy cost mm -hmm. for biofuel. Yeah. 
Yeah. So, so <clears throat> if I have to give this answer, of course, if you look at the thermodynamics, you know, whole thermodynamic system, you cannot produce, you cannot produce more energy than what is available there. So it's always less than what you can produce. And of course, uh, you know, if you really wanted to look at the energy cost, it may be, you know, maybe 30, 40% of what you can generate. So in many of the NRB digestion system, your goal is not just to produce energy. You are looking at the multitude of things. You're looking at the waste remediation, which is one way of, uh, you know, making the cost. So, so in many cases, by simply producing energy, you are not going to make money out of anorbidization processes. So in the wastewater or waste field, uh, you are getting some benefit from tipping fee. For example, if you have the uh, solid waste material, you get maybe about 50 to $60 or sometimes $100 per ton of the waste hauling. So you get some money from the waste hauling and then because of that money, you can make some profit. So therefore, yes, by just producing, you know, energy, you are not going to get money in a current market situation. So you are getting money for credit for your waste treatment, waste remediation. Maybe there could be some money coming from carbon credit issue. And there may be some money coming from the, the fertilizer part of the digested utilization. Uh, but for sure, energy is the high value, low value product. So you're not going to get money and, and energy wise, this is of course is not energy positive, it's always energy negative. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you. He say, also says thank you. <laughs> so that's, yeah. it's a pity that you cannot read the message. But <laughs> yeah. um, do we still have questions from the students? If, if no, maybe if they have further questions, maybe they can read your book. Please read his book. I think he's may contain very informative information over there. So thank That's you so problem. much for giving That's us uh, such a nice presentation. Thank you so much. So, thank you. Thank you very much for all listening to my talk. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Bye bye. If, yeah. If this, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Then.